أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كذبت ثمود المرسلين Respected elders and brothers, mothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, We are doing the Surah Al-Shu'ara which is the 26th Surah of the Qur'an We are starting today from Ayat number 141 and this is in the 19th juz of the Qur'an. We have been talking in this surah, about in Surah Al-Shu'ara, uh, and Allah Ta'ala in a very concise and short way, has been touching on the stories of the past people and the anbiya that dwelled within them. Uh, we started off, of course, with Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, and his trials and tribulations with his people. And now his people were stuck on the cultures and the blind following of their forefathers. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about Musa alayhi salam and his confrontation with Fir'aun and his confrontation with the magicians. They were into magic and that was one of their main sins. And of course, the oppression of Fir'aun was the highlighting factor in that time, which was the reason why Allah ta'ala sent a messenger and later on became the a uh, thing that destroyed his people and him as well. Uh, after that, we mentioned about Nuh alayhi salam. And Nuh alayhi salam, we know, was one of the first, or was the first Nabi with Sharia, which came with da'wat, calling people towards Tawheed. The people had turned away and started getting into shirk. The people of Nuh alayhi salam, uh, they were into majority. They felt that the majority is not believing, so that means they are on haq. They stuck on that for almost 950 years. And then we did a little bit about their destruction, and Allah Ta'ala talked about it in a, in a short way. Uh, we talked also about last week, we went into uh, Qawmi Ad. And this week we're going into Thamud. So the Qawmi Ad, they were similar to the Thamud in the way that they were involved in uh, architecture. This was one of their main thing, and especially spending and uh, overdoing it, overspending in architecture. And they were extremely strong people. They were very strong in regards to uh, their might and power. Uh, they were very good in warfare as well. Allah Ta'ala blessed them with many children, a lot of animals also. They were very fortunate people. But they were worshipping idols, they were causing facade also, whenever anybody had any uh, confrontation with them, they would kill and destroy those people, uh, and, and, and ramp, totally destroy everybody. They were zalims, you can say, they were uh, oppressors. So we did the story about them last week, and Hud alayhi salam came to them, and unfortunately they did not believe in Hud alayhi salam, فَأَهْلَكْنَاهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them. Uh, it was a rain of fire which came on them, which destroyed them. And uh, that's where we left off last week. Here in the first week, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the first ayat here, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as was mentioned before, in the same style Allah ta'ala uh, talks about it. And I mentioned that in the Jummah khutbah today, that um, this is the Qur'an's nature. That it repeats the stories, it repeats even the same wording in the stories, but yet whenever we read it, we still enjoy it. So the Qur'an's qualities are such that it should be a boring book. It should be. If, a, if you read a book or if a person watches some film or something and say it's repetitive, the same things kept coming over and over again, or somebody watches some weekly sitcom and it's the same story over and over again, so people leave it, they don't watch it, they don't read books like that where uh, you know, the same story is being repeated over and over again. And authors definitely don't go that route as well when writing their books. They try to, in each chapter, bring something new and different. But we find ourselves, when we're doing tafsir, we are mentioning basically almost the same things over and over again. In each story there are, of course, uh, new wisdoms opening up. And with the way the Qur'an has been revealed in its wording, and the beautiful recitation and these things, it becomes more and more enjoyable each time we read it. So here again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats, and by repeating also, it also lets us understand the meaning of it. 
when it's repeated also, we keep understanding, it keeps going back and forth, back and forth, it comes back again, and then the same tafsir or the same meaning that came before, it becomes embedded in our heart and we understand what Allah wa ta'ala is telling us without us even asking and saying, can you go by that again and, and repeat that, I didn't understand that. Allah Ta'ala will repeat it again. So Allah says, كَذَّبَتْ ثَمُودُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ This is something that we've been doing for the last two, three weeks. That the Thamud, the people of Thamud, they rejected the messengers. And this is something we've talked about. And in the story we will be seeing that the Thamud only rejected one messenger. And here Allah wa ta'ala has said they rejected many messengers. So either there were other messengers sent to Thamud that we haven't heard about historically and also in Quran. It doesn't seem to be that it seems to be that, uh, you know, Salih, who was their prophet, was the only messenger who was sent to them. Allah Ta'ala knows best. But here, of course, Allah Ta'ala is making us know an important fact which we've talked about over and over again. And it's something in our ummah as well, that by rejecting one messenger, you actually are rejecting all of the messengers. We've repeated it over and over again. A Muslim, if even though he says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, and even if outwardly and inwardly uh, he seems to be a Muslim, he's carrying on his life as a Muslim. But forget about this believing, even if he makes fun of a prophet from the past, he comes out of the fold of Islam. Forget about this believing. Just even mocking and making fun, as people in other religions like to do, they make fun of their messengers and comedians like to make jokes about Jesus, even though they're Christian. Uh, some will make a joke about you know Moses or Musa. The Jews aren't as much into that as uh, the Christians are. But you find the liberals and people who don't really, you know, they're loosey-goosey in regards to their religion and things like this. Uh, they will make fun of messengers and make jokes and things like that. We know that we cannot even joke about a messenger. Uh, there's no way we can do that. And of course, if a person disbelieves and says, I, don't, I reject, I believe all the prophets, but I don't believe in Salih, na'udhu billah, or the miracle that was given to him, I don't really think it's true. Uh, that person uh, has become a non-Muslim even though he may look like a Muslim and may be attesting that he's a Muslim until he leaves that and brings belief and has belief on that prophet that he rejected. Anyway, so that's the point here. In regards to Thamud, most of the ulama say that the Thamud were located in an area which is about 400 kilometers from Medina. It's in Saudi. A person can go there and visit. Uh, it's in Mecca. And it's about 400 kilometers from Medina. And it's close to a small town called Ula. There's a small town called Ula, in, uh, which is away from Medina, 400 kilometers. And uh, there, we, it's also been called in the Quran, Al-Hijr. It's also known from the Arab as Al-Hijr. Al-Hijr, because of its rocky nature. It has a lot of rocks and mountains there. Though it's desert, but there's a lot of rocks and mountains there. Uh, so if you go there, uh, you will see... Uh, the people uh, of Saleh and what they used to do, how they used to carve these incredible uh, palaces and castles inside of the mountains where you can walk inside and you can see the different rooms that they had and places that they used to uh, make compartments and things like that. And it wasn't just holes, simple holes and, and just you know, an, an, uh, you know, an, a simple little structure, but there was very, it was very detailed also sculptures and pillars and even uh, little idols you will find and, and statues and things like this that they would uh, carve with their own fingers. That was the strength that they had, that with their fingers they would be able to carve little things into the mountains. That's how strong Allah Ta'ala made them. So Allah talks about them, the Thamud, and they had rejected the messengers. Allah Ta'ala talks about who did they reject specifically. إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ صَالِحٌ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ Remember when it was said to them by their brother, Ahuhum. So again we have a prophet who is amongst his people. And this was the hikmat and the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In many ayats it's mentioned also that Allah ta'ala does not send any messenger except with the language or with the tongue of his people. Right? He's not going to send, uh, you know, to call me Thamud who was speaking the Aramic or the Arabic language. He's not going to send someone with German or something like that. Now they can't understand what he's talking about. They're obviously, it's against the wisdom. So Allah Ta'ala would send from amongst their own people. One of them Allah Ta'ala would guide and make them a prophet. And that person would come and then give a message. And usually that person is coming in the next ayat. 
was a very trustworthy man. A person that, uh, it wasn't like he was, you know, drinking or doing something wrong last week and all of a sudden now, you know, he made a toba for the ages and now he's a prophet. No, it wasn't like that. I mean, these people were respected and honored and there was not even any blemish on their, you know, on their history. Uh, before they became a prophet, everyone trusted them, everyone loved them, and then all of a sudden they would come out and come with the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calling them to that which they disliked, and that was believing in Allah ta'ala and leaving the sins and leaving the things that they were accustomed to. So Allah ta'ala says, إِذْ قَالَ Remember, إِذْ means when, and before that we will say that it is supposed that Allah ta'ala says, Udkur. Remember إِذْ قَالَ Because إِذْ has to have that type of word. That's more into the Arabic language and we're not going on that style in this tafsir. So remember, قَالَ لَهُمْ When it was said to them, أَخُوهُمْ By their brother. Who was their brother? Salih. Salih alayhi salam. He was the prophet that was sent to the Qawmi Thamud. أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ Why are you not fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why are you not fearing Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala? And this was the same thing that was said by the other messengers also. A question that was put forward to them. A simple question. Why not fear Allah ta'ala? I mean, He is the one, and it will be mentioned also by Salih. He is the one who's provided you. He is the one who's giving everything to you. He is the one who has given you all these ni'mats and blessings. Why not fear Him and why not follow Him? After this, he mentions, of course, the second aspect and that is accepting that he's a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inni lakum rasulun ameen. He says, Verily, I am a messenger who is trustworthy sent to you. I'm a trustworthy messenger. And like I said before, this was a very important quality amongst the messengers and also an important quality for us. There's always hikmat and wisdom why Allah ta'ala says these things. And it's a a message for us as well, that of course we won't be a Nabi of an Ummah, that be, that's even haram, the ulama have mentioned that one of the du'as that are haram, uh, and that are waste of time, is when a person raises his hand and says, Ya Allah make me a Nabi. <laughs> you, can't say, you can't say those type of things. Because Rasulullah is the last of Nabi. Khatumun Nabiyeen. But a person becomes a Da'i in Islam. He can call people towards Islam, and we are the Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are the ones who are the representatives of Allah ta'ala. And Allah ta'ala wants us to call to this deen. Udu ila sabili rabbik. Right? And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah ta'ala has said in the Quran also, that O Nabi sallam tell him, that this is my way. Qul hadihi sabili. Ad'u ilallah. Ala basira. So this is a, a, a thing that we have to do also. One important element of it is how we can go to the people and call them towards deen, but at the same time, watch our character, and watch how we are. Because that's going to be effective in our dawah, and that's going to be effective in calling people towards the deen. So the MBI and Rasuls, they were ameen, they were trustworthy. Us as propagators of Islam, we have to watch out how we can be trustworthy, and pious people calling people towards the deen, that will be effect, that will be something that's very effective in our da'wah, and people will not be able to make excuses in front of us, that look at you, you're a person, you were here last night, now today you're saying about Islam, you were just there last night, now today you're screaming, come on, come to the masjid, and no, we have to make sure that they don't, uh, when they're not able to say these type of things to us, by watching ourselves, and by being pious, and then calling people towards the deen, it's very effective in our da'wah, and our da'wah then has weight, and it's effective. Anyway, so here he says, Rasulun Amin, I'm a trustworthy messenger. In Surah Al-Hud, uh, in ayat number 62, uh, Allah Ta'ala says, that they had said to Salih, قَالُوا يَا Salih, قَدْ كُنْتَ فِينَا مَرْجُوًا قَبْلَ هَذَا In Surah Al-Hud, Allah Ta'ala says, another way that they said this, they told Salih alayhi salam that we had a lot of hope in you. <laughs> when he started calling him towards the, uh, the deen and calling him towards the haq. So they said, Salih, you know, before this, we thought you were going to be something real, real good. Well, you one, you know, we had a lot of raja, a lot of hope in you. We thought you were going to be, you know, our leader and, you know, and be the one who can take us forward. And you know, you rich man, and you can have the businesses, and show us how you can be a good, good leader. Now you're coming with this, Islam, and religion, 
no, no, it's, it's not what we thought you were going to do. So Saleh tells him, no, I'm a trustworthy messenger and there's no way that you can even think that I'm faking this. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follow me. Two things have been established. أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ Why don't you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's a logical question, a question that many cannot even give an answer to. Not a good answer. So it's been established already that Allah Ta'ala is one, where Allah Ta'ala mentions other ayat of Qur'an, huwa ahlul taqwa wa ahlul maghfirah. Allah Ta'ala is the one that should be, He should be feared. Ahlul taqwa, Allah Ta'ala is the one that should be feared. So He's established that, that Allah Ta'ala is one that should be feared. So follow Allah Ta'ala, and follow me also, wa ati'un. And follow me, ati'un actually means ati'uni, follow me. So here He's established also, that in their deen also was the oneness of Allah Ta'ala and the sunnah of that Nabi. That's basically, La ilaha illa, and they would say, Salih Nabiullah. Salih is the Nabi of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And then now of course, establishing like we've said it all the time, the ikhlas and sincerity of the Prophet, Allah Ta'ala says, that he said, وَمَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرِ in ajriya illa ala rabbil alameen I'm not asking you upon this propagation for this propagation I'm not asking you for any recompense if you come into Islam it's not going to be 49.95 you have to pay something no no there's nothing like this I'm not asking you for any type of recompense I don't want money from you you don't have to give me food you don't have to give me shelter nothing my reward is only the responsibility of the Lord of all the worlds. These ayats have been repeated over and over again in the beginning to of course highlight the ikhlas and the sincerity of that Prophet because when people propagate a certain thing, usually, and we know, if we see something in the internet, press the button and, you know, and this will happen or that will happen. So we know that uh, if you keep going and going, then it ends up, can we get your credit card number? Right? At the end, it ends up there. That this, we have this and that and that, that this, and this is free and that's free. Can we get your credit card number? And after that, we can go on. We can go deeper and talk more after that. So that was not the messengers. The messengers were such that if you came to them and said, okay, I'm interested in your religion, okay, let's give the credit card number, and then after that, we can talk about what's next. It wasn't like that. They did not ask from anything from the people. It was only the responsibility of the Lord of all the worlds to reward them. And this is the logical thing also. Of course, uh, the difficulties that a prophet went through could never be uh, recompensed by somebody giving him money or some food. Allah Ta'ala knows what that prophet went through. Only the perpetual and forever rewards of the hereafter can uh, be a proper recompense for a prophet's difficulties and his struggles in the world. Now, Saleh starts talking logically to his people and starts telling them, more deeply about his da'wah and about his mission and, about, and, and starts uh, telling them about the deen. He says, أَتُتْرَكُونَ فِي مَا هَاهُنَا آمِنِينَ First thing, this world is not, you know, forever. It's temporary. So the first thing he says, أَتُتْرَكُونَ Do you think that you will be left فِي مَا هَاهُنَا here Aminin, secure and safe. Each one of you had a father or a grandfather. They're not here anymore. They had fathers and grandfathers. They're not here anymore. There seems to be some type of, you know, uh, system that shows us that we are not going to be here forever. So he's talking logically to them. But you people are carrying on by building your houses in the mountains and by not turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like this is the world that will be forever. Like you're going to stay here forever. And that's not the case. So that's why uh, Saleh has put this uh, rhetorical question to them. That do you think that you're just going to be left here safe and secure? You're not going to die. Nothing's going to happen to you. You're going to get sick. You're going to pass away. You're going to die. This world is temporary. And then he uh, he, he, um, he, you know, specifies and says the different things that they are stuck to and the things that are becoming a barrier for them for accepting the faith. And he says, فِي جَنَّاتٍ وَعُيُونَ 
وزروع ونخل تلعها حظيم what were they involved in what were the things that were stopping them from faith and the things that they felt they were staying in forever fi jannat gardens they had a lot of grass and fruits and nice gardens in the back they were involved in the gardens and gardening and they were very happy with this wa'yun and springs water was coming out from the ground beautiful springs and gardens wazru'in and farms all the carrots and potatoes and everything they were farming the land and tilling the land very specific about it don't tell me about islam i got my land here i've got to take care of it no prayer nothing but just involved in these things wa nakhlin and also they were involved in date palms talhuha hadim which dates basically hadim hadim means soft hadim means something when you when you squeeze it it squishes so these were basically talhuha the dates of it were soft so sw- soft that if you squeeze them they squashed so very soft beautiful you know fresh ripe dates they had and we know in these places in next to medina and medina munawwara and we go there also we're not even arabs many of us we weren't born in that but when we go there we're looking for the dates how i can get the dates and we're eating dates we didn't know dates nothing when i first accepted islam i saw a date i thought like a cockroach i said what is this thing this is ajeeb look at that. i cannot put this in my mouth then when i ate it i said alhamdulillah it tastes so nice i never knew i would see them in the store but i would say those things are like cockroaches I don't like to eat stuff that looks like cockroach. So, but when we go there, we're not even born into that and we find ourselves looking for rutab and looking for this one and sukari and we're looking for these dates and we're eating them and we love them and we know how healthy they are also they're sweet without the sugar. We all like our sweets, but then the sugar's the problem. Those things you can eat and mashallah this, you know, uh, if they're good enough dates, they don't really uh, affect the diabetic person as much as a as a chocolate bar or something would. So, these are things that they loved. So that's why Allah Taala says, "Talhuha hadim." Of course, the Arab who was sent on Rasulullah Sallam, the Sahaba, the Mushrikeen, when they heard this hadim, oh wow, what dates they must have had! These were incredible dates that they had. So these were the things of their dunya. These were the things they liked. Right? These are the things that were stopping them from uh, from coming to Allah Taala. Also, they were involved in the architecture. وَتَنْحِتُونَ مِنَ الْجِبَالِ بُيُوتًا فَارِهِينَ And you are carving from the mountains houses. فَارِهِينَ In a very uh, skillful way. فَارِهِينَ In Arabic language we say حَاذِقِينَ مَاهِرِينَ Very skillful. Like I said, they weren't just like, you know, square box and go inside another square box, another square box. No, no. You know, these things were smoothed out like we would have in a masjid. Pillars, and in front two lines sitting on those pillars. And when you go in, they had the molding on the walls, and there was little crevices for little windows and stuff like that. These things were very precisely made, beautifully architectured. Uh, so that's why he says, فَارِهِينَ You're very skillful in this, spending a lot of time. And that's in its place. If a person wants to build a house and build a building, okay. But when it's, you know, becoming a distraction... And it's blocking you from understanding the reality of your Creator and the reality of the religion and the deen. Then this becomes a problem. That's why the prophets, they addressed it. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ Again, he says, Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَأَطِيعُونَ And follow me. Follow my message. If you fear Allah ta'ala and you say, La ilaha illallah, after that, I'll show you how to worship Allah ta'ala. وَلَا تُطِيعُوا أَمْرَ الْمُسْرِفِينَ It seems to be, and also, we will find out from later on when the naqa and the camel comes, that there was a group in the Thamud who were uh, the leaders, and they were very into this. You know, they were the ones telling the younger or the weaker from amongst their people, that listen, we need to build more houses, we need to work on our crops, we need to, you know, build more gardens. They were doing that from the top. And these people were following them. Musrifin means those people who transgress. It could be israf, meaning their expenditure, that they were spending a lot on these houses and gardens and all these things, more than what they needed, like we found in the Qomi Ad also, where they were building landmarks on the top of mountains and stuff like this. Waste of time. Or it could be Muslifin that they were transgressors of the laws of Allah Ta'ala. 
they were involved in fornication and involved in different sins and stuff like this. So anyway, uh, he was telling his people that don't follow the orders of those people who are transgressing, which seems to be the people who were on top, who were telling the other people of Thamud that do this and do that, and all of those things were Israf. He mentions even more and says, الَّذِينَ يُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا يُصْلِحُونَ Who are the Musrifeen? They are those people who cause mischief in the earth. They are causing fasad. They are starting fights. They are the ones getting you involved in evil sins. This is all fasad and things that leads to the mischief in the earth and wars and things like this. وَلَا يُصْلِحُونَ And they don't set it right. They have no type of plan to try and fix the problems of the world. They just want to cause more facade. And of course, <laughs> we don't have to explain that. We know we're seeing it right in front of us, these type of people. <laughs> they answered back. And what was their reply? They said, verily you are from amongst those who are possessed. This was a man who was Ameen, Rasulun Ameen, Marjuwan. We got a lot of hope for you. You a great person. That when the, Salih was a person who, when he came in, they would say, that's the man right there. That guy, he's, he's got a good future. And then now from there to Musaharin, now he is possessed. There was no signs of possession. All he's just telling them is some logical things. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said you were possessed. And we know that our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, also had been accused of this also, of being possessed. This was one of the things that bothered Rasulullah the most, and it's one of the most dangerous things to say. If a person says that you're crazy, right? So Rasulullah Sassam couldn't have been crazy, Salih couldn't have been crazy also. Why? Because crazy people don't have akhlaq, or they have akhlaq, or they have character uh, certain times, right? A, a crazy person, a person who's mentally messed up, you might be able to sit down with him and talk, but then after a while, after a few minutes, he might look at you and say something weird, or do something crazy. Or he's constantly always crazy, he's always majnoon, and you can't even sit with him, only his mother and father and brother, people who he's with every day, he's comfortable with them. You can't go next to him. Rasulullah was not like this. Saleh was not like this. These were people of akhlaq, incredible character. They were examples of character. So when you say he's majnoon, that can't be true. When you say he's a liar, it can't be true. They're, they're telling the truth all the time. Why would they lie now? But when you say he's possessed, so there's really nothing you can really uh, you know, put forward where a person won't get down and say, maybe he is possessed. Even now, right? Some people, they go to certain people and say that, listen, I'm getting a twitch and things haven't worked out. I lost my job. So the guy says, you know, you're possessed. Oh, Really? Someone in your family did it. Oh, really? Someone in my family. Now all of these things, there's no basis of it. Oh, he says, just give me another hundred dollars and we'll, the credit card number, back to the credit card number, right? Give me the credit card number and we'll find out who it is. So then it becomes, and then, you know, even though you're not, something, you know, you're bad luck and you got some bad things happening, but now just by him saying it, and of course there is, uh, magic is, is in Islam is something that is haram, but it's true. So there are people who of course get possessed and things like this. I'm not saying that nobody gets this problem, but there are people who take advantage of others. And then by just saying, you know, without any proof or just without, you know, without it being true, someone says you're possessed, we all of a sudden start thinking that we are. Someone says you're crazy. I'm not crazy, what are you talking about? You're lying. I know the truth, I'm not lying. You're possessed. Even good people say, you know what, you know, I, I, I get twitching over here and I wake up every day three o'clock in the morning and I don't know, I'm just sweating. Everyone wakes up 3 o'clock in the morning, so no big deal. But now he starts thinking, all of a sudden he's possessed. He sees his own shadow, he thinks it's a jinn. Now he's looking at his aunt in the corner there, why she has a twig, you know, under her foot. And what, what's, what is that? She left some twig in my house and now this is magic. Now he starts thinking that even his own family is doing the magic with him. This was the same thing that the prophets went through. When they said you are musahar and you are possessed, then the ignorant, they started believing that. They started quickly saying, yeah, yeah, you're right, he is. He's crazy? I don't know, he's not crazy. I know Muhammad. He's a liar. Man never lied. He's possessed. Oh, yes, that's what it is. Somebody possessed him. That's why he's like this. So they said this about Saleh also as well. Then also they said, 
ما أنت إلا بشر مثلنا فأت بآية إن كنت من الصادقين. They also said that you are nothing but a human being, the likes of us. They also were following that sunnah of all the people who were sent a prophet to, uh, that they wanted some type of incredible superhero to come to them. Probably an angel, maybe we've read before, they want some angel to come to them, or some person from, uh, you know, some other creation to come to them. And Allah Ta'ala, it's against the logic. Because if Allah Ta'ala would have done that and sent some eagle to them, or some jinn to them, or some monster or something to them, they would have said, listen, we are human beings, you're a monster, you do what you gotta do, we're doing what we gotta do. They would have never believed anyway. They would have had that excuse. But this is another excuse that they said that, listen, you're a human being just like us. Don't start thinking that you're a messenger and Allah's, why Allah talking to you for? Why you not talk to me? So you are just a human being, mithduna, the likes of us. Okay, listen, why don't you try and do something? We'll believe in you. Fati bi ayatin. Bring a miracle. Bring a sign. Show us that you've got the side of Allah Ta'ala. That Allah is behind you. The one that created all these things. Tell them to do something magnificent for you. In kunta min as if you are from amongst the truthful. Salih, he says, okay. He turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, makes dua, and asks that a naqa, a female camel, be come out the mountain. A female camel to come out of the mountain. Allah knows how it happened. A female camel comes out of the mountain. With their own eyes they see it also. That this camel had come out from a mountain. Mufassirin have mentioned that don't think that this is something incredible. That same Allah Ta'ala that brought a camel out of a mountain can bring a mountain out of a camel also if he wanted to. Allah Ta'ala can do whatever He wants. So He did this, they asked Him, show us something. He said, okay. Uh, let me, and they, asked, they, they said to Him that, okay, bring a camel from, you know, out of this mountain. It was just something they supposed. <laughs> okay, bring it, take a camel out of the mountain. He made dua, okay, there it goes. Came out, camel. And not only any regular camel, this camel was tremendous. Right? Don't ask for something you don't, you don't need, you know. This camel was tremendous. It was Naqatullah. So Allah Ta'ala obviously not going to bring no small little weak camel that now can't even walk. Allah Ta'ala brought out this, you know, steroid looking, you know, beefed up. Uh, the, the kids and the mother said like this, savage, you know, a savage camel. Big gigantic camel. Big, big thing, like they couldn't even want it. The, they say that, the Mufassirin say that when it was milked, the whole town was drinking from the milk. Just from its milk, alone. And the water, one day it had to drink water, and the next day the camels had to drink water. Camels of course drink water every day, no problem, but the camels don't have to drink water every day. So, it was told by them, and it's going to be mentioned here also, <clears throat> that listen, one day your camels, lock them up, keep them in their, in their barns or whatever you keep them, keep them behind their, 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 their walls, and <clears throat> don't let them come and drink water. Today, Naqatullah will drink water, and that would drink all the water, and then the next day the other camels would come and drink water. So this became a little bit of a problem for the people. They didn't believe also in Saleh after this, which was also a great sin, that Allah Ta'ala showed them a clear miracle, but still another chance was given to them, and Saleh told them that don't touch this camel. Don't do anything harmful to it. Your test now is that, listen, this camel is going to drink every other day, and don't touch, don't do anything bad to this camel. That's what you have to do right now. And they messed up, and they killed the camel. We'll see it here. He says, قَالَ هَذِهِ نَاكَةٌ لَهَا شِرْبٌ وَلَكُمْ شِرْبُ يَوْمٍ مَعْلُومٌ he, Saleh, of course, obviously, the, he takes the camel out of the mountain, and he says, هَذِهِ نَاقَتٌ This is a camel, a she-camel. لَهَا shirbun. It will have its chance of drink. وَلَكُمْ شِرْبُ يَوْمٍ مَعْلُومٍ And you will have your specified day of a chance of drink for your camels also. It will drink one day, you will drink your camels, all your camels. You had 400, 500 camels coming drinking one day, all the camels go back, on Tuesday, she only comes and drinks. All the camels, obviously, they got a little feisty and they want to come drink. They had to, you know, break their habit of drinking every day. Camels can do that. They don't have to drink every day. And then the other camels would come the next day. So obviously, this was a test for them. Now, they didn't like this. That why this? But you asked for it. You asked for the knock, not me. And then, of course, the second thing. 
ولا تمسوها بسوء فياخذكم عذاب يوم عظيم ولا تمسوها بسوء and do not approach it in an evil way don't touch it with any evil intentions فياخذكم if you do then a punishment of a very severe day will grasp you and will take you Once you kill this camel, if you try and do it, then, you know, the punishment is going to come right after that. So these are the two things. You got to sacrifice the drinking of your camels for one day, and also, don't touch this camel, do anything bad with it. The people didn't accept. The camel was doing its thing, eating, drinking, drinking every other day. The people were watching it. They were drinking some milk uh, from the camel and getting some benefit. But uh, the evil people, of course, are always up to evil. So they started now thinking about what we should do. We talked about it in another surah that we had done. And there basically was two people who were the most involved. Saduq binti Mahya. Saduq binti Mahya. She was a lady. She had uh, an illicit relationship with Masrai ibn Mahraj. These were people who were from their tribe. So Saduq binti Mahya. She was a lady, beautiful lady from the town. She wanted this camel to be killed. So the, some of the ladies, they were involved in the starting of that fitna. So she had an illicit relationship and told this Masrai that, listen, I will let you approach me and you can you know, have a relationship with me, but you got to go kill that camel. And there was another lady as well. Her name was Aniz. She was an old lady and she had a beautiful daughter. She gave that daughter to Qudar ibn Saluq. Qudar ibn Saluf. And he was the one that ended up hamstringing and killing the camel. So she said, listen, you can marry my daughter, just go with Masray. And there were some other people also, in another surah it mentions, Tis'ah, there was nine of them. وَكَانَ فِي الْمَدِينِ تِسْعَةُ رَهْدٍ There was nine of them, that they went with this group, and while the camel was drinking, they ran up to it, and they hamstrung the camel. فَأَقَرُوهَا Meaning they cut its leg. Obviously it was so big that they had to cut the leg first. When they cut the leg, then it fell. And then they, uh, they uh, you know, uh, sacrificed the camel and killed it. So that's why Allah Ta'ala says here, Where are we? فَأَقَرُوهَا And they hamstrung the camel. Meaning they cut its leg. And by cutting its leg, it fell down, and then they cut throat and killed this camel. فَأَصْبَحُوا نَادِمِينَ And they became people who were regretful. Right? They became very regretful after this, because they knew that the punishment was going to come on them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions after this, فَأَخَذَهُمُ الْعَذَابِ The punishment then seized them. The punishment came upon them. In some ayat it says, الرَّجَفَ It was an earthquake that destroyed them. And in other ones, it's mentioned Sa'iqah. It was an earthquake. Sa'iqah basically is an earthquake also. In other ayats, it's Sayha. So it could have been that the screech of Jibreel alayhi salam, he went in front of the town and screamed out loud. This caused him to have a heart attack. And also, the earthquake happened as well. And these people were destroyed. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةً وَمَا كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah Ta'ala says as He finishes all the stories of the past people and those anbiya, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةً In that verily, there is a sign. And what is the sign? We have <coughs> mentioned some of the sins that they were involved in. Uh, overdoing it in architecture, right? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has mentioned one of the signs of Qiyamah will be in this ummah the people who we would less uh, who would be the most uh, you know we would we would never think that they would be the ones who would be building high buildings and be in architecture they were the ones who would be involved in it and that is who the barefooted naked sheep herding arabs <laughs> people who can't even read and write they live in the middle of the desert they somehow and of course we could say somehow 100 years ago People will say somehow this will happen 100, 200 years ago. This hadith was not in front of the people. Somehow it will happen. Allah knows best how the Arab and the nomads, they will be building high buildings. People couldn't even build high buildings 200, 300 years ago. 
But now we see that the most high-rise buildings are in Dubai and the Arab Emirates. And now even in Saudi, they are building the highest building, even higher than the Burj. They're building one even higher in Jeddah, where it's going to, I think in Jeddah or Riyadh, where it will, be over, it will sky over the Burj also. And they know the hadith better than us. <laughs> they know, we don't even know the Arabic so well. They know the hadith better, but that's why Sadiq al Mastuk. Whatever Nabi Sam has said, it will happen no matter what. It'll happen. Even the person who speaks Arabic, he knows the hadith, he reads it, he says, Astaghfirullah, may Allah Ta'ala protect us. And that same person then is building the tall building the next day. With his istighfar. With his istighfar. So uh, these things are going to happen. This is a lesson for us. That in regards to architecture, if there's some building to build or some house to build, we can do that. But it shouldn't be such that it, uh, it becomes such a distraction that we turn away from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And similarly, all the other things that they went through. So Allah ta'ala says, in the ذَٰلِكَ لَآيَةً There's a sign in that. وَمَا كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ But even though there's a sign, most of the people, they are not going to be believers. The akhtariyat and the majority are not going to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your Lord, He is the one who is Aziz. Aziz we've said many times, He is the one who is the Almighty. It means actually Allah ta'ala has power over all of His affairs. Whoever He wants to make a disbeliever, He can make him a disbeliever. And whoever He wants to make a believer, He can make a believer. That's why Allah ta'ala says also, الرَّحِيمُ وَكَانَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَحِيمًا He is the one who on the day of Qiyamah will be merciful to those people who believed in him and sacrificed and took these as a sign and believed in Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala will have mercy on them. Inshallah next week we'll talk about the people of Lut and the people of Aqa, which was the people of Shu'ayb. Those are the last two people. And then after that Allah Ta'ala in last ruku will finish off the Shu'ara and talk about something that was the problem of the uh, of the present Arab which the Qur'an was sent on, and that was the shu'ara, the poets. Poetry was one of their difficulties. As Allah Ta'ala outlined the sins and the faults of the people before and what destroyed them, Allah Ta'ala will also talk about uh, the, uh, who were the people who the Qur'an came upon, some of their problems as well. May Allah Ta'ala give us the understanding and protect us from these sins and give us the ability to take these as signs and bring us closer to Allah Ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair wa